chapter 15, uh, Reverend Chapman has already read verses 11 through 24. I'm not going to read them again because of time. But let me just zoom in again on verse number 22. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. Today is part three of this series we've been doing on recovering from bad decisions. I think I asked y'all last week, how many of y'all have ever made some bad decisions? Hold your hands up. Let me see who you are. Great. All right. Y'all telling the truth. I can deal with people who tell the truth. Amen. Amen. Now, let me ask this. How many of y'all have made bad decisions since last week? Let me see what your hands look like. <laughs> oh, man. Y'all are really heathens, aren't y'all? <laughs> Did you raise up both your hands? <laughs> All right. You can be seated. Allow me a moment to recap what we're dealing with for the benefit of those who have been playing hooky from church for the last two or three weeks or who haven't been here. We've been looking at this theme of our church this year, the year of restoration. Somebody say, this is the year of restoration. Can y'all say it with a little more enthusiasm than that? Ooh, Jesus, I was so sad that first time. And I'm looking at this story, this 15th chapter of Luke, to look at restoration stories. In this 15th chapter of Luke, Jesus has had some tax collectors and sinners come to hear him preach. And the Bible says that the scribes and the Pharisees, in verse 2, begin to question the fact that Jesus was hanging out with sinners. And Jesus responds to them by telling them three parables. And they're all right here in Luke 15. The first parable he tells them is about a shepherd who has a hundred sheep. One of them gets lost. He leaves 99 to go find the one. That one lost sheep is important to him. He leaves the 99 to go find the one. He tells them a second parable. And the second parable says... Uh, that a woman is in, a, is in her house, she has 10 coins, 10 silver coins, she loses one, and she, she searches the house diligently until she finds that one lost coin. The Bible says she swept the house till she founds it. The lesson there is that it's possible to be in the house and still lost. I think I made that highlighted point, that it's possible to be in church but still on your way to hell. A lot of people are going to be in hell from a church pew. Look at your neighbor and say, I hope it ain't you. Then he tells this third parable. And the third parable is what we've been focusing on for the past three weeks. This is part three, by the way, of this series of recovering from bad decisions. It's part three. And he tells a story about a man who has two sons. He's done well. He's made a lively, good living. And the younger son reaches a point where he asks his father for the portion of the inheritance that falls to him. I'm recapping. Now, the way it's supposed to go is you're not supposed to get the inheritance until the father dies. Let me make an announcement right now to all of the Jenkins children. You ain't getting nothing until your father dies. Don't come and ask me early. Don't come and ask me for anything. It, it won't happen. Somebody say, it won't happen. So if you come and ask me for something ahead of time, the answer is that would be a negative. Don't ask me for it. But this father does what I wouldn't do. He gives, takes his, his livelihood, what he's earned, and divides it among his two sons. And shortly thereafter, the, the story says, the parable goes that the younger of the two sons takes his resources, takes what's given to him, and goes to a far country and squanders it on ridiculous living, riotous, wasteful living. Now, don't y'all look at me in that tone of voice because some of y'all have made bad decisions in how you spent the resources you've had. Yes. Y'all get on my nerves acting like y'all ain't done it. Well, think about how much money you would have if you could save all the money you spent on cigarettes and liquor and drugs and women and men and the clubs. I'm giving y'all a chance to say amen right there. Amen. 
this is the right crowd. I know y'all here. I know you don't want to confess and acknowledge it. But he wasted his living. He wasted his money. He lived his life loosely. He lived it loosely and wasted it. And then he got to a place where he ran out of money. And I said last week, or whenever I've been, every week I think I've said this, that as long as you got money to spend on people, you're going to have people around you. But the money, the moment runs out, your so-called friends will too also likewise disappear. This man was doing all right, happy while he had the money, but when the money ran out and the famine hit the land and he had nothing else, all of the people who he once helped provide for were nowhere to be found to help him when he needed somebody to help him out. So he's, he's lost, he has absolutely lost everything he has. And the, and the story, Jesus is telling the story, and he gets down to a place where he joins himself to a citizen of that country who gives him the lowest job available. He gives him the job of feeding the pigs. Takes no skills at all, but he's down there feeding slop to the pigs. And you know you're in a bad shape. When this young man is in a bad situation, when he started looking at the food that the pigs were being fed, and the pig food started looking good. And that's a great point. I've been trying to say this every, every week, that you can get to a place where you're so low and so down and so frustrated that you will consider doing things that once in your life you would never think about doing. Now, all of the people who, who are not clapping are the people who have actually done what they th thought they would never consider doing. Go on and preach, Pastor Jenkins. I think I will. But all of a sudden, verse 17 says he came to himself. And when he came to himself, he came to the realization that his father had people working for him who was doing better than he was doing. So he said, what I'm going to do is humble myself and go back to my father and say, I'm not worthy to be your son. Make me as one of your hired hands. And that's what he did. He made his way back he comes back to his father, and I love the story here. I keep saying this every week. When he was yet still far away off, his father saw him. I keep saying every week, somebody's here today, you're far from God, but God will see you making your way back to him even though you're far away from him. And the scripture says the father ran. Here's what I love about this. The son was walking to his father, but the father came running to him. You make one step toward God, he'll make 10 steps towards you. When his father got to him, he, he fell, kissed his neck. And what I love about the story is the son says, matter of fact, look at verse number uh, 21. The son said to him, verse 21, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. That's the, that's the son talking to his father. But look at verse 22. But the father said to his servants, that blesses me because if it had been me, I would have had a prepared sermon for my son. Oh, I would have drove the sermon home. I would have went right there. But the father never says anything to his son. Matter of fact, he speaks to his son by speaking to his servants. And he says to his servants in verse 1 22, he said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him. He tells them, number one, bring the robe. We talked about that in the first week, that that robe represents covering. And we shouted and celebrated the fact that a robe covers your mistakes and your errors and your wrongs. And we shouted the fact that God didn't expose your mess, that in fact he covered it. He kept it under, he kept it concealed. There y'all go acting like y'all ain't got nothing underneath the rug. Because if the truth be told, if the person sitting next to you knew some of the nasty stuff you did, they would get up and go sit on the other side of the church. Y'all might as well say amen. I'm talking about you. Thank God that he kept the stuff you did covered. He put, a, he put a robe on it. He put a robe on it. But he also put, and we called that covering. We said that represents covering. God will help you recover from bad decisions by, number one, covering your bad choices. But there's a second thing he does. He gives him a ring. He put a ring on it. Come on, somebody say, he put a ring on it. Beyonce said, if you liked it, then you should have put a ring on it. This father say, I love you, so I'm going to put a ring on it. And that ring was point two, identification. Somebody say identification. Point two, 
identification. God is saying to you and I, he's willing to identify with us no matter what we've done. And I don't know if y'all know that that's great news that we serve a savior and a God who will still be willing to say, you are my child. Not because you deserved it, not because you made the right choices, not because you walked down the straight and narrow path, not because you're something that he can boast up and elevate because you made all the right choices. God takes pride in taking people who've fallen from the highest point, who've made the biggest mistakes, who've made the biggest area. God takes pride in taking people who've messed up and cleaning them up and fixing them up and then saying, that's my child. I don't know about y'all, but I give God praise that he still allows me to be his child. Look at your neighbor say, you may not like it, but I'm still his child. This father, by giving, him, giving his son his ring, is re-identifying, and he's saying to his son, you're no longer, I'm not gonna let you be a servant, I'm not gonna let you be a slave, I'm gonna reinstate you, I'm gonna accept you back as my child, as my son, and that's what God does for us. Then here's the third thing he does that I want to talk about today. He gives him some shoes. Somebody say he gave him some shoes. I want to talk about shoes for a moment. Shoes. One translation says shoes. Another says sandal. I want to talk about it because I think there's a lot to be learned here about shoes. My youngest son, John Jr., has a shoe fetish. He's addicted to shoes. Now I would buy him, and not just any shoes, he likes tennis shoes. He doesn't buy one pair, two pair. He got tons of shoes in his closet. Ton, and they, they are not the shoe. See, he, they're not cheap shoes. When I was growing up, my mother and father would never dream of spending $100 on a pair of tennis shoes. No, we went right down there to Kenny's shoe store. Anybody remember Kenny? Oh, we got some people here, some old folk here. We went right down to the Kenny shoe store. And if we needed some hard shoes, we went down to Flag Brothers. Flag Brothers downtown. Do anybody here remember the Flag Brothers shoes? If you all remember those two, those, you young. That means you young. But my son, like, shoes that cost hundreds of dollars, hundreds, three, four, five hundred dollars, hundreds of dollars. My Chuck Taylors never cost. <laughs> Who in here had some Chuck Taylors when they was growing up? Chuck Taylors, Chuck Taylors. Yeah, I mean, that was a shoe right there. That was the shoe back in the day was the Chuck Taylors with the little star on the back. Come on, talk to me, has a little star on the back of the heel. Chuck! But no, he wants the Michael Jordan and Jordan heirs. What's up with that? And I told him I'll buy you one pair, but just buying you pair after pair after pair, that would be a negative. <laughs> but it's okay, he, he got him his shoes and he would keep them for a couple months and then sell them. I ain't never bought a used pair of tennis shoes in my life. <laughs> but these used shoes have value. People, and they paying five, six, seven hundred dollars for used pairs of shoes. Tennis shoes. He, he, he's, he's a little entrepreneur. John Jr. is an entrepreneur. The boy got cash. I'm gonna have to hit him up with some cash sometime. <laughs> But these shoes, I, I don't know why they're so valuable, why people willing to pay hundreds and not thousands of dollars for them. But I do know the concept of shoes because shoes do mean something in life. Shoes do have a, a meaning in life and that's why I thought I would talk to you about shoes, these shoes that this father gave to his son and, and under the banner of shoes, I wanna tell you, it represents direction. Somebody say direction. His father is giving him shoes, and in the midst of him talking about shoes, giving him these shoes, he's saying to his son that you've left my direction, you've left my life, you didn't heed my counsel, but now that you're coming back home, I'm willing to re-engage you in life, and I'm willing to give you direction. You didn't listen to it before, you rejected it in the past, but I'm willing to re-engage you in life, and I'm willing to walk with you again and give you a sense of direction. A lot of people mess up their life because they don't listen to direction.
So there's four little subcategories underneath this heading of direction that I want to talk about in the four minutes that I have left. Lean over to your neighbor and say, we're going in overtime. <laughs> Tell them on the other side, we're going to be late. We're going to be late. Tell them on the other side, the traffic's going to be a mess. But you'll get over it. Come on, tell them. They'll get over it. Here's what the first point, sub point to direction is, is guidance. I don't know about you, but I need guidance in my life. I don't care how, how old you get. I don't care how many experiences you have. You're always going to need people in your life to give you guidance. Now, when you get to the place, can nobody give you guidance? You are too big for yourself. Can't nobody tell you nothing? That's a problem. But this father saying to his son by giving him the shoes, I'm willing to re-engage you in life and give you guidance, give you direction, give you direction. Now, now the Bible teaches this. It says when you're a child, you obey your parents. But when you get older, you honor them. I believe that God surrounds you in life with people who are capable of giving you godly guidance. I believe it. And you make the mistake that there's nobody who can give you guidance and nobody can make suggestions to you, can't nobody talk to you, you're out of control. Look at your neighbor and say, you're out of control, you're out of control. Nobody can tell this young man anything when he got his inheritance. His father couldn't talk him out of it. Anybody close to him couldn't tell him don't do it, but he went on and did what he wanted to do. He made bad choices. He couldn't listen, wouldn't listen to nobody and it jacked up his life. He ended up losing everything that he had. It is important for you and I to understand that God places people in your life who he's anointed to give you guidance. Who do you listen to? This father gives him his shoes back. He's willing to give him guidance. And I want to talk to people today and tell them I want to challenge you today because the Bible is crystal clear about this. When you reject guidance, you're walking away from God's ability to give you direction. If can't nobody tell you nothing, then God can't tell you anything. Let me tell you who gets on my nerves. People who talk about the fact that they, they don't listen to people, they only listen to God. Let me tell you something. You cannot listen to God without listening to people. God talks through people. And the question is, who are the people that God has put in your life to help you out, give you direction? And here you are doing what you want to do, and it's leading you down a road of bad choices, bad decisions, and it's going to mess up your life. You know what I did? I came to the realization, because when I was young, my father knew my father was it when I was a kid. Then I got into those age, teenage years when I came to the realization that my father didn't know nothing. I know I'm not the only one who went down that street. But then I got to a place now in my life that I look back and see my father knows a whole lot. Now, I don't have time to give you, walk through all these verses, but jot these verses down and get, read them when you get an opportunity. In Proverbs chapter 20, verse 20, somebody say 2020. That's what our kids are missing. They're missing 2020 vision. They can't see 2020. You need 2020. Read Proverbs 2020. And Proverbs 2020 says, if you curse your parents, your lamp will go out. Curse your parents, curse the people, reject what they tell you, reject the people that God ordained to be in your life. And God says, since you ain't going to listen to them, I'm going to shut the light off. Wow. I thought I would get at least the parents jumping up shouting, saying, preach on, pastor. Because that's what happened to a lot of people. That's what happened to a whole lot of you. Because you cursed your parents and God shut the light out, so now you don't know where to go. You don't know where you are and you don't know which way to go. When, when God turns the light out, you have no sense of who you are, where you are, or where you're supposed to be. And that's why we got a lot of adults grown, don't know what they do in their life, don't know what their purpose is, don't know what their assignment is in life. It's because God has shut the lamp off. Why? Because you cursed your parents. That's Proverbs 20, 20. Somebody say you need 20, 20 vision. Proverbs 30, verse 17, write it down. Don't have time to turn there. Proverbs 30 and 17 says you mock your parents and your eyes will be plucked out. 
make fun, reject the people that God has put in your life to help guide you. And the text says, your eyes will be plucked out. Yeah, maybe the lamp is still on, but even though the lamp is on, you can't see because your eyes are gone. As a matter of fact, there are multiple other verses in the Bible that talks about this very thing, rejecting the counsel that God has put in your life. Some of y'all need to go back to your parents and ask them to forgive you. Let me say that again. Y'all missed it. Some of y'all need to go back to your parents because you made horrible choices. You married who he didn't tell you, your parents didn't tell you. They didn't bless that marriage, but you went on because they didn't know no better. Now you're reaping hell and havoc, and you want to know why you're in the hell and havoc that you are. But can I tell y'all something? It's not that God does not want to put shoes on your feet. It's not that he doesn't want to guide you, because God wants to provide guidance for everybody's life in here. He wants you to walk in his perfect will. He wants to give you direction for life. But if you reject the avenues that he's put in your life, then you are rejecting God. Oh, I got to hurry up. I'm acting like I got all day. I wish I had more time. But not only does, he, does the shoes represent guidance, but two, shoes number two represents stability. Somebody say sub point two, stability. Yeah. Holler back at me, say stability. Yeah. Y'all not saying it loud enough, say sub stability. See, back in those days, when they had on shoes, when they, they had on shoes or sandals, they generally called them sandals, the, those shoes got strapped to their feet. They got tied down and tied on their feet. And what those tied down sandals did is gave them the ability to be stable in life. It gave them the ability to walk on rough ground. And so when God wants to give you shoes, when this father wants to give shoes, God wants to restore you and give you shoes. He wants to give you something that will help you be stable and be able to walk on any kind of ground that you are around whether it's smooth ground or tough ground, rocky ground or tough, no matter what it is, he wants you to have the ability to walk on tough ground. We have a mix of people today who as soon as some little trouble come in their life, they got drama, they just start to break down, they crying, they can't handle it, they can't walk over stable ground. And I'm telling you today, when God gives you shoes to put on your feet, he gives you the ability to take a licking and keep on ticking. He gives you the ability to keep moving even though all hell is broken loose around you. He gives you the ability to be tough. Nothing is more frustrating than to have grown people who are walking away just because a little trouble come in their life. They want to walk away from their marriage, walk away from their job, walk away from church, get some shoes on your feet and be able to walk on some tough ground. You tiptoeing through it because you can't handle this. We ain't got no shoes on your feet. Yeah, you, can, you have to walk gently. But get some shoes on your feet. You don't quit church because somebody talked about you. I stopped going to church because of the way that people were treating me. So what? How they treat you on your job? Are they in love with you on your job? Y'all done got me started now. Y'all forgive me. Did everybody treat you nice at the grocery store? You didn't stop you from going to the grocery store. Did everybody treat you nice at the mall? No, but you up in that mall every week. If I was going to stop going to church because of people talking about me or treating me wrong, I would have quit church decades ago. But greater is he that's in me that I can't, I'm, I, I'm not going to let what people say or how they treat me stop me from worshiping the almighty God in the midst of his people. I refuse. Never have I met so many weak, whipped, jacked up, tore up people who whip and cry over everything. Shut up and get some shoes on your feet. Suck it up. Keep moving forward. Keep moving. Keep it moving. I'm not going to stop. Get your shoes. Put some sandals on your feet. Strap them on. They strapped them on so nothing could take them off. His father's giving him some, some shoes and his father's basically telling him, son, I want to empower you to be able to move forward in life with assurance and confidence. 
I got to hurry up. Here's three. The third thing that the shoe represents is readiness. Somebody say, readiness, I'm ready. It means to be ready, ready for battle, ready to go forward. Yeah. I was in um, Texas this week. My wife and I were in Texas, and we were checking out at a hotel. And she said, can you find out if we have TSA pre-check on our tickets today, which that allows you to go through the security line and not have to take your shoes off. God could create some great things for you. She said, because I want to wear these boots. And if I have TSA pre-check, it means I don't have to take my boots off. But if we don't have TSA pre-check, that means I'm going to have to take my shoes off, so I ain't going to wear the boots. So I had the assignment and responsibility of finding out whether we had TSA pre-check. That's why she lets me travel with her so I can find out. So she waited until the last piece of clothing that she was going to put on when she got dressed were going to be her shoes. As you do know, it takes her a couple days to get dressed. <laughs> Come on, brothers, don't leave me hanging out here by myself. <laughs> days! <laughs> Y'all are wimps. Come on and stand up and say amen. Yeah, give me some strength to say this. Because my wife is coming to the next service. I won't be able to say it at the next service. When you're ready to move forward, she says, I'm ready to put on my shoes when I find out what the deal is. When you put shoes on, it means you're ready to move forward. The, the father is saying to the son, I'm giving you the shoes. And by me giving you these shoes, it means I'm, I'm willing to help you be prepared for where it is you're going. I'm helping you to be ready. You, you know what happens with a lot of people is opportunities come up, but they're not ready when the opportunity comes. Here, here's what God has said, that he's going to give you, oh, I love the Lord. I wish I, I wish I had time. I got to hurry up. He says, I'm going to give you shoes. I'm going to give you guidance. I'm going to give you stability, and I'm going to make you ready so when the next opportunity comes that you have not been ready for, when I give you shoes, when that next opportunity comes, you will be ready. Let me close with number four. I got to hurry up. It stands for freedom. The fourth sub point is freedom. Why? Because the slaves and poor people didn't wear shoes. And so the father says, I'm going to give him shoes. I want to make sure everybody knows he's distinguished from one of my servants. He's not one of the guys who I've hired and I'm paying. This is my son. And so he gives him shoes. Uh, a lack of shoes means means. You're a servant. It means you're not wealthy. You're not well-to-do. A lack of shoes. But the father says, I'm going to give you shoes. It means, you're, hold up, you're not a slave. It means you have freedom. God says, I'm going to give you shoes so you can be free. Now, I don't know who I'm preaching to, but all I know is that you're up here in this camp somewhere. And as I begin to close, as I bring this closing, as I bring my church, as I bring this message to the close, here's my first closing right here. We serve a God who will give you shoes. He's going to put some shoes on you. He's going to give you some freedom. Come on, talk to me, somebody. He's going to make you ready. He's going to make you stable. He's going to give you guidance. And if you cry out and come to him as a son, I tell you today, he'll forgive you. He'll wash your slate clean by the blood of Jesus who died on the cross, was buried and rose again from the dead. He'll begin to order your steps and direct your path, forgive you of your sins. He'll give you stability in life, give you the ability to take a licking and keep on ticking. We serve a God who is so awesome and a mighty savior who has the capacity to help you ready for whatever you face in life. We give you a level of freedom, freedom that you'll never be a slave. Who am I talking to today? Somebody needs to get it right with God. 
get out of your seat and come down here right now and meet me and get right with the Lord. He loves you. He cares about you. He spared your life. Make your way down here quickly. I don't have a long time to, to, to appeal and beg you and all of that. I just need you to come. Those of you who know how to pray, can y'all start praying right now? Start praying that the people that God is calling will come right now. Can you begin to pray right now in the name of the Lord that God will call people to come forth and say, that's me. I need to get it right. I see you, young man. I'm so proud of you. Somebody else, come on, right now, right now. Somebody else, don't put it off. Don't delay it. Don't push it in the background. He's waiting. He's waiting. He's waiting. Hallelujah.